joining us. This is Jim. How do you pronounce your last name? I should have asked you that before. Um, it's how, how it sounds, Scarpace. Actually, it's supposed to be Scarpacci. When my grandpa came from Sicily, it got flattened, and I never changed it back. So maybe one day, but for now, it's Scarpace. Okay, yeah. As a Jaco, I was going to say Scarpacci. So. Yeah, Scarpacci, yes. Um, so Jim has 25 years of mental health and substance use disorder and criminal justice field experience. I, I think that's fascinating. I'd love to just hear about that. Um, he's currently an assistant professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. I taught there for 10 years. I loved it there. It was wonderful. That was in the 90s, mid-90s, early, I don't know, 2000s. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so he's done that since 2004, which is the very year that I left. Um, he's a past supervisor for the Department of Probation and Court Services in DuPage County and assisted in developing a mental health program for high-risk youth, supervised therapist probation officers in the forensic setting for work with juvenile offenders with mental health, substance abuse, and criminal behaviors. Wow, that's intense work. Thank goodness, because we need good people to do that. Um, Jim is experienced with chronically mentally ill adults in a hospital setting. He does treatment planning, assessment, and preparing families for discharge, as well as in the community as a therapist with adolescents with severe mental health disorders and coordinated a residential facility for high-risk children and adolescents involved with DCFS. Currently, he works with addictions, trauma, group therapy, crisis intervention, and family therapy. So this is perfect. I'm so glad you're here because, um, you know, we, we do a lot of, of trauma work. We have a whole EMDR team. And the thing that we're constantly needing to remind people is you have to ask them about their drug and alcohol use. You have to talk to people with trauma about their drug and alcohol use. Of course, they're just so connected. So I'm thrilled to have you here. I think this is going to be really important information. So we will um, have a place you can, if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section. It's at the bottom of your screen. If you pull your, <clears throat> excuse me, pull your cursor down, you'll see a Q&A box. Looks like two little bubbles above it. Please make sure to add your question there as opposed to the chat section. The chat, we're not pay really paying attention to other than, you know, between the three of us, if Aline, who's in the background with my picture up, um, we're just going to be using that so that we know if there's an issue that we need to deal with. But if you have a question, we absolutely want to hear about it. Put it in the Q&A section. I'll be tracking those. If there are some questions partway through, we'll, you know, make sure that we attend to those. And then there'll be plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So we want this to be uh, interactive as much as it can. So, Eileen, I hope I didn't forget anything. Uh, Eileen is our fabulous intake coordinator and also coordinates these events. We do these the third, there she is. That's what she really looks like. I don't know why my photo is up, but it's the, we do these the third Friday of every month. They're free. We only charge you if you need a CEU because that costs us administrative time. <clears throat> but we're glad that you could join us today. Anything else, Eileen, that I didn't no, mention? No, every, yeah, everything's, uh, you said everything, um, except for if anybody is on the phone, which I don't see anybody right now, but if you see anybody sign in a, a, on a phone, please let them know that I need to know who they are. Got it. Thank right. you. Have a good uh, event, you guys. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thanks for all your help. Uh, that's disturbing. <laughs> anyway, so, all right, Jim, I'm going to turn it all over to you. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Mark. All right, well, hi everybody. I'm gonna share my screen with you. As Margo pointed out, my name's Jim. Um, I'm currently executive director of Gateway Foundation in Aurora, Joliet, Skokie, and soon to be Downers Grove. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. We're gonna do just a couple little housekeeping things um, as I do that. Um, what you're gonna see is my PowerPoint pop up and I'm gonna go ahead and set this up from the beginning. Hopefully it's clear. Um, if it isn't, or along the way, what I found with doing Zoom, and I've been doing Zoom now for a little while in my teachings with the Chicago School, is it works pretty well, but sometimes things get blurry, or sometimes there's a technical difficulty. If that's the case, just send something in the chat function and let us know so we can adjust. And for me, adjusting might mean I need to come out of the PowerPoint and go back in, which is fine. Um, also, so you can see the entire screen, 
um, because some of the slides may be blocked by my picture and Margot's profile picture. There's a small little tab to the left of the screen panel that says hide thumbnail videos. It looks like an underline um, up on the top there by my picture. You can hit that and um, the photos will go away to allow you to see the entire screen if that's a problem for you. So today we're going to spend um, the next hour, hour and five minutes, so about 1045 in the presentation. I'll leave question time at the end around 1045 to be able to answer questions that you might have because along the way, some questions that you may have early on may be answered later in the presentation. But if not, please feel free to ask questions at the end. And I think Margo or Aline is going to um, share those questions with me and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, we're going to talk today about a couple things, you know, most importantly trauma, you know, we're going to talk about what it is and what it isn't, but we're also going to talk about some other things that strongly influence trauma. And for me, being in the field for as long as I have, what I found is, you know, trauma and trauma work is just as much about the clinician as it is as, as it is about the client. And when I say that, really what I'm referring to is the clinician's approach the clinician's perception of the person they're working with and how the clinician um, deals with or doesn't deal with that trauma issue irregardless of if they're a trauma specialist or not. Because as much as we'd all love to send our clients with trauma issues to a trauma specialist, in reality, there are not enough of those. And some clients have you know, minimal to limited funding. So you might be working in a Medicaid program, for example, and there are no trauma specialists in that program and no trauma specialists in the community that take that client's insurance. And so you may be the person, even if you didn't intend to be the person that has to deal with that trauma or help that client deal with that trauma, whether your primary focus is substance use or mental health. Um, and so a gateway, for example, as we start to talk about trauma exposure, um, we really talk about it as trauma responsive work meaning are you responding appropriately to that client's trauma history and are you helping them develop a foundation to address it? And so that's something we'll talk about today. Just a little bit about us. Um, we are the largest provider of substance use disorder treatment in Illinois. We're a not-for-profit, so we work with clients that have commercial insurance as well as clients that have Medicaid, Medicaid managed care, and clients with no funding. And we've been doing this now for 52 years. We treat adults and adolescents throughout our programs. We have programs across the state of Illinois, as you can see. We also have outpatient programs, standalone outpatient in Joliet, Gurney, Swansea. Um, we now have a Skokie program off Dempster Street and we'll, be soon to, we'll soon to be opening a Downers Grove program off of um, Highland. So we really offer the whole continuum of services from residential to outpatient for men and women, um, as well as adolescent services um, and addressing both substance use and co-occurring disorders, such as mental health conditions and trauma. Um, as I start to talk about our trauma treatment and the approach that we are focused on, one of the things that I want to point out, and I think for all of us, this is important, not just for Gateway, um, but for us especially, we recognize that in order to be effective, we needed to go where the medical research was going. We needed to understand what that was, and we need to understand what is effective treatment. And one of the things I'm going to talk about with you today along the way is this idea of stigma and how stigma can create barriers and access to treatment for people who need it, whether they have trauma issues, substance use disorder, or mental health conditions. And for a lot of people, the reason those barriers get put up is quite honestly because of us, because of clinicians. And we have good intentions, right? We're all here because we wanna help people. But sometimes not knowing, we use the wrong language. And that language sends a message to the person, to the potential client or patient that there's judgment or that we believe this, is, this condition they're struggling with is who they are. And that sometimes can be carried through because of just a word we use or a concept we share that in our minds is, is innocent, is not in any way stigmatizing or problematic, and, and it is, but in reality it is. And it may be because we don't know any differently, or maybe because we're not aware of what the research has suggested in terms of language that we should be using in the clinical context to help people that struggle. And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that, but for us at Gateway, 
our tagline is addiction medicine saving lives. We really want to make sure we're supporting both evidence-based practices as well as medical, medical approaches to treating disorders um, supported by the research. And I think for all of us, that's important. Um, let me tell you a little bit about substance use and we're going to kind of back into trauma, if you will, um, because what I know and what some of you may know is that 80% of clients who have a substance use disorder have what we call a trauma trigger, meaning they have a trauma history somewhere in their past, whether it be recently or, or, or years ago, um, that because it was untreated and because we know some of the stigmatizing uh, thoughts and feelings that come with experience a trauma incident started they started using drugs or alcohol or both to self-medicate those feelings of shame guilt anger hurt and over time that self-medicating using substances developed into an independent substance use disorder but it was connected to their trauma experience that was untreated and their trauma history um, so for me and for us at Gateway, or for any of us that work with substance use disorder clients or clients with mental health issues, if you don't believe you're gonna be working with trauma, you're gonna be surprised because you will be, because they go together. And for a lot of people who are having struggles to the point where they need counseling or need treatment services that have a trauma history, most of the time that trauma history has not been treated appropriately and they've turned to either substances or mental health issues like depression or anxiety or mood disorders have become more pervasive because that trauma wasn't treated appropriate, appropriately when it should have been. Um, now, all that being said, going back to the slide, um, we know that only about 10% of people who need substance use treatment actually receive it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the biggest in our field is stigma. Um, so one of the things I wanna talk about today is how do I start a conversation regarding concerns, and I, here it says surrounding substance use, but really it's more than that. It's how do I start a conversation with someone that doesn't create barriers, that's not stigmatizing, that really allows them to feel like they can open up and share information with me around trauma, substance use, mental health, um, where they feel like they're not being judged. And in our field, there was language that was used along the way that really created barriers for that, that clinicians with good intentions were using but that was really stigmatizing and really not supported by the research. And some of you might be still using that language today, and that's not a, in any way a slight or a criticism of you, but it's something that there's, it's never too late to really start to look at what can I do differently? How can I engage people in more productive conversations around clinical issues? And so we're gonna talk about that today. And I really would ask you to think about that as we're talking, think about for me, what, am I, what can I do different? Are there things that I'm, as I'm listening to this, I could change in terms of the language I use, the labels I use, um, or the statements I use? Why do people use substances? You know, we talked about some of this, right? Self-medicate to manage emotions. There's also a strong genetic predisposition to using substances. And, you know, for example, uh, alcohol use disorder is a very um, clear, determination of that. So example, if you had a biological parent who had a alcohol use disorder per DSM-5 diagnosis, you have a one in four chance of having an alcohol use disorder. If you had two parents who have an alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder for that matter, you have a one in two chance of having a, that disorder. And that's very similar to what we know about genetic predisposition to mental health conditions like depression or anxiety or mood disorders. Be, and mostly because both substance use disorders and mental health disorders impact the limbic system of the brain or that pleasure center. And it's about um, neurotransmitters that are either lacking or an overabundance that really lead to some of the common mental health conditions we see, as well as the common substance use disorder conditions that we see. Um, you know, in addition, there's social pressures, especially as a teenager. There's a lot of social pressures in this day and age still um, around using substances. You know, we're now in a society in Illinois where marijuana is legal. That's a whole other training and conversation. But there is a lot of societal pressures to use substances. And for some people, they'll be able to use substances like marijuana and alcohol, for example, and use them in moderation and be fine. But for others, that won't be the case. And the, the initial use of that substance, especially if there's a genetic predisposition, will trigger a addiction pathway that is there at birth 
that is now activated that will create a situation for those individuals where they won't be able to stop, where marijuana does become a gateway drug into other substances, where they develop severe substance use disorders in addition to mental health disorders. Um, and even if they started to do this, not because of peer pressure, but because of trying to self-medicate these unwanted feelings they have as a result of trauma, they could still develop a substance use disorder, a medical condition. And so what we wanna think about as clinicians is the only way we're gonna help individuals truly is if they share their information with us and feel safe enough to share everything because that's gonna be the best way for us to help them. And so the other thing I would encourage you to think about as a clinician is how do I engage a client, but also how do I inspire them? Because really change is about inspiration. If you think about anything that any of us have ever done, whether it be changing our diet or starting a workout routine or quitting smoking or you know trying to complete a graduate program or a doctorate program, it was about being inspired and staying inspired in order to complete those goals. And it's no different for our clients. We have a responsibility to inspire them, to help them to feel like this is something they can change, that this is not who they are, and that they have the ability to make changes in their life. And for a lot of us as clinicians, and we'll talk about this near the end of the training today, some of us has, have lost that inspirational edge, that energy, either because of burnout or compassion fatigue. And we really need to figure out if that is the case for us, how to get it back. And what can I do to maintain it? Because if we can't do these things, if we can't inspire someone, then all of the information and the facts and the knowledge we have from our graduate programs and our books and our intervention strategies that we've learned, we're all, are only gonna go so far. They're gonna hit a wall um, because people won't feel connected to the treatment process. So that's something we're gonna talk about as well when we talk about trauma. I like this acronym and you know when we think about inspiring people this is really tied to it quite closely and it's this think acronym and some of you may have seen it right is what I'm saying true that's so important you know if I'm going to give information to someone think about it. if I went to a doctor and I had high blood pressure and I said what do I do about it and the doctor gave me inaccurate information and I followed that how damaging that could be for me it's the same thing with mental health. It's the same thing with treating substance use disorder and trauma. Is the information I'm giving them true? It's not my opinion, but it's supported by research. I have, it's supported by a medical model. That's so important. And these other pieces are really about energy, right? It's about personality. Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? We talked about that, right? Is what I'm saying necessary? Sometimes we say things to clients, maybe because of countertransference or other issues that aren't necessary. Maybe it's a statement or it feels like we're lecturing them or we feel like we need to lecture them. And then that becomes about us, not about them. And it's something we need to be careful about because I've seen over the years things said to clients, again, not with ill intentions, but things that are not necessary and certainly not helpful to the clinical or therapeutic process. And then most importantly, is it kind? These are people coming to us at the lowest points in their life a lot of times. They've accomplished great things along the way, many of them, and they're, they're wonderful people. But when we see them, we tend to see their problems and not the person behind the problems. And so sometimes those problems, which can be severe and sometimes even trigger our own value systems or countertransference, create an emotional reaction in us, and sometimes we say things that are less than kind. And really, as therapists, we all have a responsibility under that non-maleficence clause, right, to do no harm. And when we say things that aren't kind, really we are doing the opposite of that. It's not beneficial. A lot of people used to believe in the old therapeutic community mindset that if I break you down, I have to break you down to build you up. And there are even some people in recovery from substance use that swear by that mindset, but the reality is for every two people that helped, it hurt 10 people. Because if you have complex trauma histories or mental health backgrounds, that mentality as a therapist is only gonna cause more risk of harm than good. So you really need to think about that. And this really is not just for counseling. Honestly, this goes for any interaction we have with a coworker, with a peer, with a supervisee, with a supervisor. If we're not talking this way, 
then we're better off not saying anything, honestly. Okay, move here. Um, so I'm gonna share a little clip with you. And unfortunately, because we're in a virtual platform, I can't see your reactions and I can't necessarily get the verbal response from you. But I wanna share with you as we move forward in this training, two concepts. One is perception is reality. Our perception becomes our reality, whether it's accurate or not, whether it's helpful or not. And the same thing goes for our clients. Um, their perception becomes their reality, regardless of what our intentions are as a clinician. And the other thing is language is power. So we need to make sure we're using the correct language that supports our cause, which is helping people improve their condition and recover, whether it be recover from a substance use disorder, a mental health condition, or a trauma history. And so I'm gonna show you a little clip to show you how easily perceptions can be swayed. Some of you may have seen this before, some of you may have not, it's called an awareness test. Um, let's make sure I can pull this up okay. Let me blow the screen up. And hopefully everyone can hear it. I'm sure Margo or Aline will let me know if they can hear it. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? All right, so your job is to count out how many passes the team in white makes. Let's take a look. Go! Okay, so you should have a number right now. Let's see if you got it. The answer is 13. So if you got 13, congratulations, but there's a but. Let's watch the butt. But did you see the moonwalking bear? I wonder how many of you saw the moonwalking bear. My experience has been doing this type of clip for a long time now that most people who have never seen this before have not did not see the moonwalking bear. But well, I'm going to show you where it is. It's easy to miss something you're not looking for. I think a lot of you the second time around, I'm sure saw the moonwalking bear, man in the bear suit moonwalking. Um, we missed it. We miss it because why? Well, mostly because we're looking for something else or we're looking for a framework that fits the lens that we're viewing that client through. And so we discard sometimes potentially very important information that could help that client, we let it just go. It goes right past us over our head or we ignore it because it doesn't fit the lens or framework that we're seeing this client through. And what I found over the years in doing work, whether it be trauma work, substance use work, working with adolescents, working with adults, is it happens often. Mostly because as clinicians, we're trained to be problem focused. We're trained to be focused on someone's problem issues that we've learned about in an assessment or that we've, we've gathered ourselves through the assessment process. Um, and because of that, we miss things about the person that could be crucial components to help them deal with their trauma, substance use, or mental health issues. And so we really have to keep our lens open and understand that some of what we know or believe to be true in terms of issues in helping clients may be only part of the puzzle. When I work with counselors, you know, I come in and we're staffing cases, right? You guys all do this. And what's the first thing people do when they staff cases? They tell you about the problems with the person. And so I'll ask them things like, what's their favorite color? What's the client's favorite color? What do they like to do? What interests them outside in the community? Um, are they a parent? Um, are they in a relationship? you know, what's important to them? And you know, I had one counselor once, it made me laugh when I asked those questions, she said, I don't know, I'm not dating them. But you know, that can be funny and I understand why she would say that, but the reality is we need to know as much, if not more about someone's strengths as we need to know about their challenges or problems because strengths are the foundation that help people not only 
accomplish goals, but stay inspired, going back to that original idea. And we, in order to do that, we have, in order to inspire, we have to know people's strengths. And I, I think some of us probably do strengths assessments, but what I'll tell you is what I've seen over the course of years is the strengths assessments aren't nearly as elaborate or as detailed as the problem focus is. Um, and so sometimes, especially in the, in the field I work in, that's easily overlooked, someone's strengths, and or how someone views substance use disorder is easily overlooked. And I wanna show you a clip about stigma before we talk a little bit more, but before I do that, I wanna share with you a fact that, you know, going back to perception is reality that might surprise some of you. Um, you know, I always ask this question when I have live trainings or vir virtual trainings where I can see everyone. And I ask people, in what decade do they believe the American Medical Association put out an article and that article was put out after decades of research preceding it, supporting the fact that a substance use disorder is a disease of the brain, a medical condition, not a moral failing, not a character flaw, not a weakness, but a disease of the brain, a medical condition that could be treated, just like other medical conditions could be treated. And, you know, I ask people that, and it's funny the answers I get, you know, I, I get answers like 1990, 2000, 1980, 1985, occasionally I've gotten a 1970. The correct answer is 1956. In 1956, the American Medical Association put out an article and it started with alcohol use disorder and then proceeded to talk about other substances that alcohol use disorder is a disease of the brain that can be treated. And that was preceded by 30 years, 30, three zero years of research prior to 1956 that told researchers and scientists that. Yet here we are in 2021, almost, right? 2020, we're going into a, a, a world of new generation and science and we're in a COVID pandemic and people still don't believe that addiction is a disease of the brain because mostly their perceptions, as we head into 2021, their perceptions are, I can drink and walk away from it. I can use marijuana and walk away from it. These people, these people, quote unquote, right, are weak, they don't care, they don't love their family, it's not important to them, they're not strong, they must have poor values. None of that is true. We know none of that is true, yet people act on what they believe without facts and without information. But again, since 1956, we've known that, and here we are in 2020, going into 2021, still with people not believing it. So let me show you a clip, because um, I think this resonates with that message. Just give it a second here. It's gonna be a little blurry in the background, it's meant to be.
so, you know, that gives you just a little taste of the stigma piece I was talking about. And that's not, that was filmed in England. You saw some use in certain words. That's why they were there. People ask me that sometimes. Um, <clears throat> however, what I want, why I want to share that with you is because I think for a lot of us, as we move forward in our training and in our work with clients, we have to recognize how we can perpetuate stigma. And unfortunately, there's a book out there that is misused and you're looking at it that does that. And it's called the DSM. Um, and some of us use the DSM incorrectly. And I would venture to say some people on the, on the training right now today use the DSM with good intentions, mind you, but incorrectly. And let me talk to you a little bit about that. The DSM was created years ago. There's been many, many versions since the DSM-5 that you know, preceded. It was developed for two reasons, to identify clusters of symptoms, and for one, so identify clusters of symptoms that can be diagnosed, and therefore, once you know that diagnosis, it gives us an idea as psychiatrists, as medical physicians, as therapists, as counselors, on how to treat that with both medication and psychotherapy. That's what it was meant for, as appropriate. Some disorders don't require medication, of course, some do. Some require more intense psychotherapy than other disorders. The severity of a disorder would dictate a level of care someone might be in from an inpatient hospitalization to outpatient. That's what it was meant for. It was never meant, and I want to say this again, it was never meant to label someone by their disorder. And I'll give you an example. If I went into a doctor's office today and, you know, my dad died of prostate cancer five years ago, and so I get a PSA test every year. And I went in that doctor's office, he said, Jim, your PSA numbers were high, but you know, we caught it early because you've been getting it every year. Last year they were fine. And um, I want you to see an oncologist because I think it's early stage prostate cancer, but the good news is you're young and we caught it early. And I go into that oncologist's office and I'm really scared and I'm really nervous because I don't know what to expect. I'm feeling overwhelmed with all of this. And you know, am I gonna be able to get, uh, be successful in fighting through this? Am I gonna be able to survive? So I'm really nervous. And then an oncologist comes in and he looks through my chart and he says, Jim, nice to meet you. I see you're here because you are cancer. If he said that to me, my reaction not only would be awe, shock, maybe anger, but I would feel so hopeless. I would feel so not, if that's, it's not a word, but so not inspired in trying to manage and battle this illness. But he would never say that to me. Yet in our world, in the treatment world, for 25 years, I ask people why they're here. And they'll say, I'm bipolar. I'm here because I'm bipolar. I'm here because I'm depressed. I'm here because I'm borderline. I'm here because I'm a drug addict. I'm here because I'm an alcoholic. Most people didn't wake up one day and decide this. Someone told them that. And it was probably someone with good intentions. And maybe it was a clinician who was using the DSM but it's being misused. And if you identify someone by their disorder, if you say, this is who you are, you are this, the hope and the inspiration in overcoming that goes down exponentially. Because this isn't who they are. This is a disease, an illness that they're struggling with that they can overcome. Because as you saw in the video, their mothers, daughters, sons, husbands, wives, teachers, lawyers, doctors, business professionals, they're churchgoers. They're connected to their community. That's who they are. This is an illness they're struggling with. So it's very different to say you are bipolar versus let me tell you about bipolar disorder. Here are some of the symptoms you're experiencing that meet the diagnosis. Here's the course of the illness. Here are treatment options that we can utilize to help you manage it. That's a different conversation. The latter is a conversation that inspires. The former is a conversation that labels. And if you're gonna inspire and, and help people to move forward in dealing with these illnesses, we can't be creating barriers. We can't be using language that can be considered stigmatizing. The other thing I always show people is when you look at the substance use disorder diagnosis in the DSM, here it is, right? Here's the science of substance use disorder. And what you're gonna see in here is not only the science, but you're not gonna see two things. And I guarantee you, if you look through the DSM from front page to last page, you won't see the word addict or alcoholic in it anywhere. That's because those are not medical terms. Those are 12-step terms. And 12-step is a natural support in the community. It's a great support, but it's not treatment. 
I always, going back to that cancer example, if I went to a cancer support group, I should expect some things. I should expect people who will support me, who've been where I've been, who can provide me with emotional support, people I can connect to, that's great. But if I went to that support group expecting to get the latest and greatest treatment for my cancer, to see doctors and nurses that can recommend medications and therapies to help me with my illness, I would be disappointed. Same thing with 12 step. 12, I'm not knocking 12 step, but 12 step language and 12 step groups are support groups and that's what they are. They're not treatment. And as professionals, as treatment professionals, there's no place for us to use 12 step language and treatment. The DSM talks about substance use disorder. It talks about alcohol use disorder. It talks about um, severity of those disorders. It talks about the cognitive symptoms associated with it, change in brain circuits. That's the language. That's the approach as medical and treatment professionals we need to be using. But yet in, in this day and age, there's still people in the treatment world who are really just doing glorified 12-step groups. And that's not gonna benefit people initially. Once they're in recovery and they're on the right and medications for their substance use and mental health and their trauma has been treated, that's a different issue. Um, and this isn't just my opinion. The White House Office of National Drug Control Policy in 2013 put out an article, I'm sorry, 2015, basically supporting that um, concept. And it says we need, it basically was labeled, we need to stop talking dirty as clinicians. You know, and they were also talking about things like clean and sober. If you have a clean or dirty drop. This is a disease of the brain, a medical condition, yet we're still using the terms clean and dirty. How does that not imply judgment or social stigma? And so, you know, as we're talking about trauma, which I promise you I'm gonna spend the next, the remainder of the time talking about, something you need to think about. Am I using the right language? Maybe I'm using alcoholic and addict because I just think that's what you're supposed to do, but it isn't. And the research doesn't support it and it's not medical language and so, Maybe I'm doing that with other things too, like mental health conditions. I'm telling people you are, and then giving them their mental health diagnosis label. If you are, again, no harm, no foul if you make decisions to change it once you're aware. I'm not suggesting that in previous clients that you worked with, maybe things couldn't have been better or they could have been more inspired if you didn't use it, but you can't go back. All we can do is move forward and try to use best practices as we learn about them. And here's just some of the language from that White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, and I'll share, I'll be happy to share my PowerPoint with Margo or Aline um, after this, and they can send it out to you if you'd like it, because there's some links in here that we probably won't get to that you might want to check out. Talked about this already. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. Why do people with trauma issues not get treatment? And I'll tell you why. Because sometimes we inaccurately lock ourselves or handcuff ourselves by our own perception of ethics. We believe that if we're not trauma specialists or trauma experts, that we can't talk to people about their trauma. We shouldn't, it's bad. Some, I've heard some people say, oh my gosh, false memories, Jim. First of all, false memories are, were created in, if you've heard about false memories years ago, it was through psychoanalysis and hypnosis that problems with false memories were created it had nothing to do with talking to people about their trauma or dealing with trauma treatment, but people still connect those two things. Like I can't talk about trauma, I might create false memories. That's, that's not even connected. But we handcuff ourselves by our own ethics and therefore we limit our ability to help someone who has a trauma history. Or we believe we're gonna send them to an expert. They're gonna take care of that. So we'll talk about their substance use mental health, but we won't talk about their trauma because we shouldn't. We'll send them to an expert, they'll take care of it. And we already talked about this. As much as that'd be wonderful, in the ideal world, it's not reality. There aren't the experts that everyone can go to that are gonna just treat their trauma for different reasons, whether it be location or funding source or capacity. Sometimes we have to be the ones as clinicians, as therapists, even if it's not our area of our expertise with supervision, of course, to help someone manage those issues. And for us at Gateway, it's really important that people understand the relationship between their trauma and their substance use disorder. And not that we're gonna be able to address and deal with all their trauma history in the 35 days they're in residential with us, but it's important that we establish a foundation where people understand that connection, are able to start to share their trauma experiences and when they started to self-medicate with substances as a result, 
And then of course that we connect them to people as they leave here, but now they have a solid foundation in trauma treatment that they've established. So they continue to move forward and hopefully stay in recovery from drugs and alcohol. What's important to know about trauma and grief? Um, first and foremost, we know that trauma and grief can stunt emotional and psychological and development until it's processed and dealt with. And that significant behavior and emotional problems can develop as a result of untreated trauma. I worked in probation for years. I worked with adolescents and what I saw was this. Adolescents who were angry, who were acting out, who were uh, sorry, picking up domestic battery, domestic violence charges, fights in school, many of them, many of them, an overwhelming majority of them had untreated trauma histories as kids, whether it be a few years ago or several years ago, whether it be sexual abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, physical abuse. But because they were acting out, they were getting labeled with diagnoses like conduct disorder. Um, and the problem with that, or oppositional defiant disorder, the problem with that is those labels, because going back to language is power, have connotations to a judge in a court system. Where do I put someone who has a conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder? Because those disorders by definition say you have behavioral problems, you act out against authority, and quite honestly, you just don't care. Where do those people go? Where do those kids go? They went to detention centers. All of those kids, every one of them that I saw on probation in those years there had a trauma history that was untreated. And because of that, they developed behavioral and emotional problems. Instead of going back and saying, this kid has a trauma history, it's untreated. We need to get them into trauma work or treatment, or we need to start that work ourselves. Because I had therapists at probation as well as probation officers to help them work through this and get some support we slap conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorder diagnoses on them because of what we are seeing right in front of our faces at that moment and sent them to detention centers instead of treatment. When we talk about doing no harm, that's probably the worst harm you can do to an adolescent. Trauma experiences and the longer time between the traumatic event and the counseling, when they start getting help, the harder it is to sort through behaviors and defense mechanisms that have been used to manage pain but it's not impossible, it's just harder. If let's say, if, for example, I've worked with adults who have opiate use disorder, who had a trauma trigger in their teenage years, they're 40 now, so it's been 20 years. Well, since then, they, on top of the trauma and untreated trauma issues, they've developed unhealthy coping mechanisms, a substance use disorder, depressive disorder, an anxiety disorder. They may have developed some personality traits or maybe a full-blown personality disorder because it hasn't been treated, but it's not who they are. These, are. these are unhealthy coping strategies and disorders that have been developed as a result of that untreated trauma. And again, there's a lot of layers there and we have to unravel them as clinicians, but we can do that and we can help them. And we've done that here at Gateway. And it's about understanding the person behind the traumatic event. This is a great, I think, clip about that. Um, and I put up here, the best thing you can do as a clinician is talk about the trauma with someone. It's our own fears and anxiety as clinicians and worries about, oh my gosh, if I talk about this, it's gonna get worse. Now, I will say to you, there is a percentage of the population, depending on how recently the trauma has been or how severe it was, that might, if they have a depressive disorder and you start talking about trauma, might start to develop our, our recurrence of suicidal thoughts or feelings as they're starting to talk about it. But that's a small percentage of the population and it's not a reason not to treat the trauma for everyone else. And of course, for that person, you wanna help them manage those suicidal thoughts and get them to a safe place if needed. But the, the trauma, the harm has already occurred when that trauma experience happened to that individual. It's the healing that hasn't started yet. That person hasn't been able to heal from that trauma because they've never been able to process it. And instead have turned to substances and their mental health issues have become more pervasive. Their relationships have suffered, but they haven't been able to start to process the trauma. And as clinicians, we gotta help them do that. We have to help them first recognize, because depending on if it's been years since the trauma, some of them don't even recognize the connection between the trauma and their mental health issues. There's trauma and unhealthy relationships or the trauma and the personality disorder traits, or the trauma and the substance use disorder. They don't even recognize that connection anymore, that there is a connection. They've pushed that trauma out of their mind, maybe unconsciously or consciously. 
and we we have to help them and we first to do that though we have to be able to assess that appropriately and we'll talk about that in a minute um, <clears throat> categories of trauma for some of us we're looking for the big three and it's the big three for me in terms of trauma that most people look for is sexual abuse physical abuse and um and or some kind of child abuse component so this either they had abuse as a child they've been sexually abused they've been physically abused but there's other things that constitute trauma and one of the things i'm going to share with you and i'm going to encourage you to take a look at your own because we'll never be able to cover it in here is there's a website and that website's called the national child traumatic stress network and if you want a resource on how to manage trauma how to understand it how to treat it these are just some types of trauma that are listed in here, as you can see. But in here are articles, research, videos, treatments, practices, trauma-informed care, trauma-responsive care, screenings and assessments. It's an invaluable tool that's set up by the you know, US for clinicians to tr help people who have trauma disorders. So if you aren't familiar with this site, the National Childhood Trauma Stress Net, Traumatic, sorry, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, I'd encourage you to take a look at it and you really do some work there. Because again, even if you're not planning to treat trauma, you're going to treat trauma. It, it is part of what we do. Um, all right, so let me move on. The other thing I want to share with you, um, and I'm going to share this briefly, just a few minutes of this clip because it's too long for us to watch, but I would encourage all of you to watch it all. Because um, one of the things I share when I do this trauma training in, this, in the community is I ask people, if I gave you the following multiple choice question, how would you answer it? And the question goes like this, untreated trauma can lead to the following conditions. And A, is substance use disorder, B is depressive disorder, C is cancer, D is heart disease, E is quite answer A and B only, which is um, substance use disorder and depressive disorder, and F is all of the above. Most people, not all, but most people will answer A or B, so depressive disorder, substance use disorder, they might answer um, e, A, and B together. Um, so, but what I found is the overwhelming majority of people do not answer all of the above, and that's the correct answer. And that's surprising to a lot of people. And so I'm going to show you a clip, and we're going to then I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. I'm a Verizon engineer. And I'm part of the but team building 5G ultra wideband. It's already available in parts of select cities. And it's rolling out in cities around the country 25 times faster than today's 4g network it's the fastest 5g in the world this is 5g built right in the mid 90s the cdc and kaiser permanente discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or a packaging chemical. It's childhood trauma. OK, what kind of trauma am I talking about here? I'm not talking about failing a test or losing a basketball game. I am talking about threats that are so severe or pervasive that they literally get under our skin and change our physiology. Things like abuse or neglect or growing up with a parent who struggles with mental illness or substance dependence. Now, for a long time, I viewed these things in the way I was trained to view them, either as a social problem 
refer to social services, or as a mental health problem, refer to mental health services. And then something happened to make me rethink my entire approach. When I finished my residency, I wanted to go someplace where I felt really needed, someplace where I could make a difference. So I came to work for California Pacific Medical Center, one of the best private hospitals in Northern California, and together we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the poorest, most underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. Now, prior to that point, there had been only one pediatrician in all of Bayview to serve more than 10,000 children. So we hung a shingle, and we were able to provide top quality care regardless of ability to pay. It was so cool. We targeted the typical health disparities: access to care, immunization rates, asthma hospitalization rates, and we hit all of our numbers. We felt very proud of ourselves. But then I started noticing a disturbing trend. A lot of kids were being referred to me for ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But when I actually did a thorough history and physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the kids I was seeing had experienced such severe trauma that. It felt like something else was going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. Now, before I did my residency, I did a master's degree in public health, and one of the things that they teach you in public health school is that if you're a doctor and you see a hundred kids that all drink from the same well, and 98 of them develop diarrhea. You can go ahead and write that prescription for dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, or you can walk over and say, "What the hell is in this well?" So I began reading everything that I could get my hands on about how exposure to adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office and he said, "Dr. Burke, have you seen this?" In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day changed my clinical practice and ultimately my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC, and together they asked. 17 and a half thousand adults about their history of exposure to what they called adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes. You would get a point on your ACE score, and then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking: two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. Sixty-seven percent of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6 percent, one in eight. Had four or more aces. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between aces and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer, and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know. Some people looked at this data and they said, "Come on, 
you know, you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are going to ruin your health. This isn't science. This is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand better than we ever have before how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance dependence. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful if you're in a forest and there's a bear. <laughs> But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Okay. So, you know, some of, if you didn't know that, um, you do now. Um, and so we, Here's a couple things that happened as a result of even prior to me, you know, showing these clips and we doing us doing this training here at Gateway. Um, we received information, and if you don't know this, you know, you'll know it now. The state of Illinois received an F, F, F grade in assessing and diagnosing adverse childhood experiences or traumatic disorders. By the American Medical Association and CDC, the state of Illinois received an F. And what they said in that research is that doctor's offices, um, therapists, um, psychologists, schools, police departments are not doing their due diligence in assessing the risks and impact of childhood trauma or ACEs. The ACEs study and the ACEs assessment have been around for a long time. We recognize that Gateway is a substance use disorder treatment facility that we needed to do a better job. We were not happy with that information. And we recognize that we weren't doing enough to assess history of childhood trauma at admission. And we weren't even asking the right questions. We certainly weren't using the ACE. Um, in my PowerPoint, there is a, a link from the CDC on the ACEs study, but I wanna show you the ACEs questionnaire. Um, and Basically, it's, a ten, it's 10 questions, um, and they, they range from, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid you might be physically hurt, yes or no? Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? It talks about sexual abuse, question number three. Um, Question number four is focused on 
family relationships, knowing your family loved you or thought you were important, special, or did you feel your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other? Um, neglect, question number five, having enough to eat or, um, or drink or had to wear dirty clothes, no one was to protect you, or parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it. Divorce, physical abuse in the home. Was your mother or stepmother often grabbed, pushed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, kicked, bit, and hit? Did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic? They use that language because it was, it's meant for the general community. Doctors ask these questions. Was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide? Did a household member go to prison? 10 questions. What do we know? You heard it in the video, right? Most of society has one ace. It's very common to have one ace. If you have four or more ACEs, your risk of both mental health disorders and physical disorders goes up substantially. In terms of statistics, I would say and challenge exponentially based on what we know. And you're talking about 12 times suicide rate, four times the rate of heart disease or cancer. You're talking about substantial increases statistically. Yet what we, why we got an F in Illinois and why most states got Fs is we don't ask these questions. When I go to the doctor today um, with my daughter or son, they'll ask me, or when I go to the doctor as an adult, they'll ask me if I drink or smoke, right? Or how I eat. But actually in the last year, my pediatrician did ask my daughter who's 10 these questions, but most of the time doctors don't ask these kind of questions. You would think, well, that's what therapists are for. A lot of therapists don't ask trauma history questions. They don't even ask. You know, maybe it'll come out in the session, but we can't wait for it to come out in the session. We need to be asking questions up front. And some therapist said, oh my gosh, you know, look at these questions, Jim. If I ask these questions, they're so awkward or people are going to be uncomfortable. The harm has already occurred. The trauma has occurred. The healing has not. We incorporated this gateway into our assessment process two years ago. In these two, or sorry, three years ago. In these three years, have I had people who, who have refused to do, answer the questions? Yes, we've had some, but a small amount. Most people want to talk about this and, and want a, a place to be able to share these experiences. And I can't tell you how many people, when we initialize this, because now what we do is we take this information at the assessment, it gets passed on to the primary counselor and residential and outpatient, and they're working with that client in understanding not only what happened, but the relationship between those experiences and their substance use disorder or their mental health conditions. Um, and I can't tell you how many clients have said, wow, I wish someone would have talked to me about this 10 years ago, 15 years ago, six years ago. It would have made a, such a difference in not only my substance use disorder not getting so severe, but allowing me to feel like I could access services sooner and that it was okay to talk about this because I felt so ashamed, embarrassed, angry, upset, betrayed that I just kind of pushed it away because every time I would try to bring it up to my family, they'd either dismiss it or I would be afraid to bring it up to my family because I knew they wouldn't understand. And so I guess my mission to you and what I'm asking you to think about is, are we doing enough? Are you doing enough to assess trauma history? Are you using the ACEs? If you're not using the ACEs, are you using a tool like the ACE? Because we know if we don't, the potential for this person not only to struggle psychologically, but physically with legitimate medical conditions that can cause death go up substantially. And again, that's not my opinion. That's the research. That's what we know. It's what we've known. Yet again, perception becomes reality, right? If we don't know this, our perception is, yeah, they might have mental health or substance use issues, but it's not going to cause them cancer. Well, that's not true. It could, and it does. So as we wrap up, let's talk about this. You know, what do we do? Trauma treatment is complex. Trauma counseling and helping people identify trauma and, and sharing their story is not. It's about creating an environment where people can feel accepted and that as counselors, we're working with the client to help them understand their experience with that trauma and most importantly, what is and is not their responsibility? Because one of the biggest issues with trauma and why it leads to substance use disorder and pervasive mental health issues is that people blame themselves. They feel guilty. They feel like they did something to allow this to happen to them 
regardless of what type of trauma it was. And they carry that message internally to the point where it becomes a distortion. We've heard of cognitive distortions, right? But those distortions, those CBT distortions, or those cognitive distortions that need to be treated with BCBT become their reality. And now their lens is that reality and everything they do, everyone with they, inter they interact with, every emotional experience they have, what they choose to do in terms of self-medicating, all shift back to that lens that's distorted to begin with because they've not had treatment. They've not been able to talk about it and process it. And if someone say to them, this isn't yours to carry, this was a decision someone else made that harmed you, but this isn't yours to carry. And the relationship between this incident and the behaviors that you were got involved in and the choices you made as far as you know, starting to use substances and then having a substance use disorder, there's a connection here and let's talk through it and let's help you to share your story so you can understand the connection and together we can either work through it or help you get connected to someone while we're working through it or when we're done, if it's residential, for example, or outpatient in a treatment center, that you can continue that work. And it's not rocket science. If you're looking for trainings on you, know, Jim, I don't even know where to start. Again, if I, here's some great sites. And I, again, I'll share this PowerPoint so this can get out to you. But there, you know, if, if you click here, um, we go back to um, a trauma site. This is Medical University of South Carolina. They have a course um, for trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's components to it. The whole course takes about eight hours to go through. It's online. It's cost, it used to be free, but they're granted. It's, and I think it costs like $35 or $40 as a counselor. I think it's less if you're a student to go through the course. And these are the, these are the components of it. It's worthwhile. You know, it doesn't say, um, oh, you know what? You, in order to go through this course, you have to be a trauma expert. And I'm not suggesting that everyone's going to be able to do all this trauma work with their clients for different reasons, but we need to establish a foundation. We have to let people share their story. So this is a great resource. If you've never taken this course, I'd strongly encourage you to take it um, because it's beneficial in so many ways. All right, let me keep track of the time here. I'm doing okay. Um, one of the things I always talk about with my therapist is we have a responsibility to provide clients with trauma disorders, mental health disorders, co-occurring disorders, ESP. And that's not extrasensory perception. It stands for educate, skill build, and practice. We need to provide them with some knowledge. Most people have no idea about the relationship between trauma and mental health, trauma and substance use disorder, trauma and unhealthy relationships. We call it disease education or trauma education if it's focused around trauma. They don't have any knowledge of that or the connection or understanding. And they certainly don't have the skills to manage it. And so what we wanna do is provide them not only with education and skills, but the opportunity to practice those skills because it's so important to their recovery. Um, briefly, some effective intervention strategies. These are things you guys know. We know motivational interviewing is a big part of trauma treatment. That's probably not a surprise to a lot of you meeting people where they're at. One of the biggest things I always like to reinforce is the treatment process is a slow one sometimes. And sometimes we have to be patient with the person and recognize that they're not gonna move through treatment as quickly as maybe we'd like them to. Um, and the other big piece is that we have to involve their support systems. We know from the research that people maintaining recovery from mental health, trauma, or substance use have the best chance of maintaining recovery if the people that they're around most of the time, their loved ones, their friends, their family members, members become experts in their recovery and what they need. But a lot of times, it's fair to say that clinicians don't do everything they can to try to involve family members or support systems because we become comfortable in the one-on-one -on -one counseling process and sometimes we don't ask about that or we're afraid to ask like oh they won't want them to be involved so i won't even ask if i can get a release and it's so important that we have those conversations because if we can involve their family their chance of recovery goes up substantially these are some evidence-based practices i referred to them a while ago and really what this means is evidence-based practice is when we're working with people in the substance use disorder world, we know these practices have shown research that has been done for 15 or more years. So they're evidence-based to be effective in managing substance use disorder. And you'll see some of the things I talked about on here, right? Family involvement, evidence-based practice, cognitive behavioral therapy, evidence-based practice, trauma-informed care, evidence-based practice, co-occurring dual disorder, 
programs to deal with the mental health and substance use, evidence-based, medication-assisted treatment to treat both mental health and substance use disorders, evidence-based. One of the last things I wanna leave with you with is this, and I know we're at 1045, I'll just need a few more minutes. Um, to do all these things I talked about and to be effective, you have to have an emotional tank. This looks like a gas tank, right? But it's your emotional tank. Let's pretend it is, because I couldn't find a picture without a gas picture on it. Um, your emotional tank as a counselor, in order to inspire, to motivate, to help people identify their strengths, has to be full. If you're burnt out, if you have, have compassion fatigue, if you're just tired emotionally, you need to take some time off, honestly, because if you wanna give the best experience to your patient or client, you have to have a full emotional tank. You have to have the number one evidence-based practice that I didn't include on that list at your disposal. And some people are like, what's that? And I ask people what it is when I do these trainings out in the community and they'll say all kinds of things like CBT or they'll say, um, I need to have trauma experience or trauma background, none of that's true. The, the most, Effective evidence-based practice that helps so many people treat clients with all types of disabilities and disorders and medical conditions is this, sorry, it's hope. Do, are you hopeful? Do you believe that this person is more than their, dis, their, their, more than their disorder, that they can change, that they have the ability to address these problems? Do you inspire hope? in everything you say and do. Because all this stuff I just told you over this last hour, hour and 15 minutes is wonderful and it is helpful and it's beneficial to the clinical process. But I always tell my students this, that if you can't, you could know everything you need to know about this book or about this theory or about this intervention. From page one to page 500, you could recite it to me. But if you can't sit down with someone and make them believe that they're more than just their problems. If you can't inspire hope, all of that knowledge is for naught because you're never gonna get to it because you're never gonna get past the engagement sessions with the client because they're not gonna believe you're gonna be able to help them. They're gonna believe you're judging them or they're gonna believe there's no hope for them. And that's, a, that's the least furthest thing from the truth. It's the furthest from the truth, sorry. But, it happens sometimes. We have clinicians that, and I, can, and I say to the students, I can't teach you this. I can teach you the books, the knowledge, the skills, the interventions. I can't teach you hope. If you can't do that, then you know this isn't gonna work. Okay, we're at 1048 and I'll open the floor here for questions. Wonderful. Jim, this is such great information. I really appreciate you doing this. And I see Jen Fuja is available. We're going to get to you in just a moment. Uh, you'll have actually the last word, but uh, a, a couple of quick things. Um, before we finish, polling will open in about six minutes. In order to get your CEU, we need you to take the poll. So at 1055, that will be available. And uh, Jim does have a slides deck. We will send that to you. You don't have to email us. Eileen will send that to you. You will automatically receive the slides deck if you registered for today. So no need to email to request that. So, okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. Great information, Jim. I'll tell you, I got my first job in the field on an addictions unit in 1986, which is 34 years ago. And I can tell you, I think the attitudes of clinicians and of, because the attitudes in our culture have changed so little in those 34 years. And you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a blame thing, it's that these are really complicated issues to, to deal with in treatment. And I think clients are really smart. There are things they just don't tell us about then. Right. You know, so I think this kind of information is imperative. We have to be asking about it. We have to be asking about it upon intake. So, and we need to continue to ask because just because you ask once doesn't mean somebody's going to feel ready to tell you, but it really, the stigma just is, is just as powerful now as it was in, in 1986, as it was in the 1950s, as it was in the 1930s. So thank you. This is great information. So questions. Um, speaking of stigma, this is from John. He's on our staff. How much is stigma attached to how we learn to approach issues in K through 12 education and into college? Well, that's a, that's a um, 
complicated question. What I will say is this, and what I experienced a lot in my time, I was a SAS worker for a number of years. So we, I worked with adolescents trying to keep them out of the hospital. And then of course, in adolescent and juvenile probation, I worked a lot with teachers and a lot with schools. And I think the, the stigma, especially associated with substance use disorder in schools, I would, I would be sitting in meetings advocating for IEPs for kids who had substantial trauma histories or who had substantial mental health issues. And I would hear things like, and again, I don't think it was people, teachers, um, administrators of meaning to be mean or disrespectful, but I would hear things like, well, they're in a gang, they don't need an IEP, or they have a substance use disorder, so they're not eligible for an IEP, as though those were disqualifiers. Like if I had a trauma history and involved myself in gang activity, I still didn't have a trauma issue or a mental health issue because that because I was in a gang, I'm not eligible. Or because I had a substance use disorder as a kid, as an adolescent, as a result of untreated trauma or depression, because I had the substance use disorder, because I had drugs in the school or paraphernalia in the school, I'm automatically not eligible for an IEP. And that's disheartening because really, if we're gonna try to help these students be successful, we really need to treat their core issues or their primary problems and not be distracted necessarily. Doesn't mean we don't hold them accountable for their behaviors, but we still have to give them the support they need for things that they need support for. Yeah, for sure. And it's, uh, you know, when I'm still hiring folks, I always ask who are the people you really don't want to treat and more often than not, it's anybody with the substance yeah. use. So, okay, we have a few more questions. It looks like somebody raised a hand, but if you have a question, if you would please put it in the Q&A box, then we can efficiently get through them. Um, I appreciate that. So here's another one. This is from Aaron Schwartz. Have you ever considered that many of the terms used in the 12-step program are not negative and actually can be inspiring? So, yeah. So first and foremost, what I want to say about 12-step is Gateway strongly supports 12-step after recovery, um, after treatment. The 12-step community understands those terms and they understand the purpose of them. And for people who have been in the 12-step world or who have left treatment and gone to 12-step or who have been introduced to 12-step um, in treatment, the terms make sense to them. They start to understand them. But people who are struggling with a substance use disorder, um, who have never been exposed to treatment, who are overwhelmed, who are scared, who don't know what to do, who thinks this is, who think I must be weak or I'm a bad person or this is who I am because that's what they've been told or that's what they believe. Those terms, al alcoholic and addict, are not inspiring to them because they don't understand the, the premise of those terms. And there's so many negative connotations associated with alcoholics and addicts in our community um, that someone in early in the process of needing treatment is going to see those as barriers and is going to shut down. And that's what we've seen. Now, post-treatment, when someone understands the illness, understands what it is, and they go to 12-step, they're much more able to be, I think, um, motivated by those meetings and those terms, but initially they're a barrier. Yeah, for sure, because they they're, they sound like dirty words. Yeah. You know, you're in, uh, yeah. it's like you're swearing at someone yeah. quite yeah. Um, So this is from Megan Mann, also from our team at Juniper. Hi, Megan. Um, Jim, how important do you think forgiveness is in treating trauma? So important. Um, I think that first though, when I talk about forgiveness, what I'm referring to is per people forgiving themselves because a lot of people blame themselves inaccurately. And, and you know, we talked about those distortions. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, people have to let go of things they hold on to that's not theirs to hold on to and forgive themselves. So first and foremost, that's the most important step. Now, what, when, if you're asking me about forgiving the person who was the offender or the person who um, you know, imparted the trauma or was involved or responsible for the trauma, um, you know, that's a personal choice. You know, as a therapist, I think we have to be careful about demanding that someone forgive the person who hurt them. But I think that we have to have that discussion and be able to process with them and put that out there as an option to explore because can people recover without forgiving? Some can, some can't. Some people can forgive, but will never um, have a relationship again or could, can't have a relationship again with that person. So yeah. I think it's on a continuum. And I think we just have to be able to explore that with the person and be open to meeting them where they are and helping them process through that. Yeah, 
for sure. Wonderful. All right, this is from Armand Cerboni. Good morning, Armand. Longtime colleague, wonderful person. Um, would you agree that stigma is a form of chronic trauma? And would you agree that sexual and gender minorities is a form of chronic trauma? If so, then all marginalized and stigmatized persons experience trauma ongoingly through life, yes? Sure. I mean, I, I think when I, that website I showed you, National Childhood Trauma Treatment Network, um, they talk about that type, those types of trauma, absolutely. And I think that, you know, trauma is also on a continuum. And I think that all of us experience traumatic experiences some point throughout our lives on different severity levels. And sometimes society creates stigma and trauma. And, you know, we're in the world of electronic media and we've seen social bullying on, on Facebook, on um um, sites like that, social media sites. And so I think especially today in the day and age we're in and, 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 and because of the experiences, because of the current culture, I think trauma and trauma experiences are um, unfortunately happening more now than they ever have when yeah. it comes to those types of issues. Yeah, and I would say from what Armin's talking about, that you know, being in any kind of stigmatized group you know, when you're talking about sexual and gender minorities, then you have multiple stigmatized identities that you're trying to work your way through. And if the treatment doesn't address all of those, it's not going to be complete. People are not really going to be healing. So we just have about three minutes left. We have a couple of other questions. Um, so then, you know, people are doing their polling and I want to give Jen a, a moment. So why don't we take one more question and uh, then we'll let Jen say something about Gateway. Um, I have a quick announcement about our next program and that will take us through the day. If people have more questions, can they email you directly, Jim? Absolutely, yes, I would appreciate that, uh-huh. Okay, great, okay. So the last question is from Louise. Uh, do you have suggestions or ideas for prevention for parents in the cases of developmental trauma? And it looks like Louise uh, had her, her first job at Gateway Independence as a music therapist. So she's glad you're using this component of uh, ACEs. Um, yeah, I mean, when, we didn't get to watch the full video, um, the TED Talks video, but one of the things is educating parents early on um, about childhood trauma and its implications is so important in terms of prevention because just like you would educate a parent on how to cover a wall socket or wall outlet for a young infant, or you would educate a parent on nutritional issues for their kids, um, especially if the kids are struggling with juvenile diabetes and what to be aware of. We, as counselors, when we're working with clients and for the, those of us that work with children and adolescents as the Juniper Center does, um, even if there isn't trauma going on, but we're concerned about just some of the things we're hearing and relationships at home. It's really important to, to educate that primary caretaker or parent about risks and, and implications. And, you know, I can't tell you when you talk about cognitive distortions and what people's experiences are, how, you know, people can just dismiss this type of thing as, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I had a woman once, I was treating her daughter who was 13 and she was being, um, emotionally abused and, and really, I think, set up to be um, soon sexually abused by this woman's boyfriend. And you can he just hearing what was going on at home and the concerns, I ended up calling DCFS. But in the conversation with her, I talked to her about this and I really did some of the education. And her response was, she's fine. I was sexually abused when I was little. I got over it. She'll get over it. People's perceptions of this are just so skewed either because like for her she didn't have the trauma treatment and I'm hoping she didn't mean that but there are people who believe those kinds of things and minimize the risks associated with trauma and that's so unfortunate because we know the lifelong implications of issues like that are just so severe or can yeah, be severe. for sure and and I'm gonna finish up with uh, Adrian's comment. And then there was a question about what Illinois is doing about it, but maybe we can answer that another time, but that utilizing ACEs in schools is sorely needed. Yes. That, I'm sure. And really everywhere, every yes. clinical office, 
um, doctor's office really yes. being able to ask these questions. All right, Jen, do you want to say the last word and then I'll make the announcement for next month? Yep, and I'll be very quick because Jim did an excellent job of um, everything that I want to say. I just wanted to make one announcement. Um, at our Lake Villa site, our Out in Recovery, which is our LGBTQ, should be reopening November 1st. We have a new clinical director just with COVID and things of that sort. So kind of, uh, we just, we're, we're, we're reopening it. So we're very happy on that. We'll send um, uh, information out on that. But again, too, my email will be shared and I appreciate everybody attending. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Jim. Great information. Thank you, Jen. We appreciate Gateway doing this for us today. Again, we do these on the third Friday of every month. We will send out an announcement to you next month is, uh, this is David Carbonell. He's written several books. He's a local guy, a uh, wonderful psychologist. We're gonna, going to do an all day, six hour intensive training instead of doing our quick webinar. Um, that'll be next month. This is David Carbonell and it's outsmarting your anxious brain just chock full with very useful strategies and techniques that you can use with your clients immediately. Um, it's, I think it's going to be a good day. We've done this with him before and gotten great feedback. If you can attend, it's $99 for six CEUs, and those are uh, CEUs for psychologists, social workers, counselors, uh, marriage and family therapists. So wonderful information today. Thank you, Gateway. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Aileen, for all of your work. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, again, the Juniper Center does these once, once a month. Please join us again. We hope to see you. Thank you. Take care, Thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.